Good day, everyone, and welcome to the fourth and final day of Virtual Trade Week. If you weren't with us earlier in the week, uh, I am John Perdue, the Executive Director of the Office of Trade Relations, and I've only been here a short time, so if I haven't met you yet, I just wanted to say that I look forward to doing so and to working with you in the coming days. Uh, on a slightly more solemn note, I need to mention that today marks the 19th year since the attacks of 9-11, and this agency was stood up in the wake of that event to prevent future terrorist attacks and has done a remarkable job in fulfilling its mission. But it's days like today that I want to acknowledge that it is you and the trade and in the private sector that partners with us that makes that a viable mission. Uh, our first uh, keynote speaker today, Deputy Commissioner Robert Perez, was actually the first director of the Customs Trade Partnership Against Terrorism, which actually fulfilled that mandate or set up that, that mandate formally. And so uh, he's done a lot of work in this area, and uh, most of you are probably familiar with him from his engagement with industry over the past several years in his current position. So in lieu of a lengthy introduction, I will simply hand it over to Deputy Commissioner Perez. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be with you and to participate in our virtual trade week. I'd also like to thank all of you for taking time out of your own busy schedules to join us and I hope you found this week's sessions to be informative and beneficial. Before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge today's solemn anniversary. September 11th, 2001 was a uniquely tragic day for our nation. It touches each of us personally as we vividly remember where we were on that fateful day. The very existence of CBP was born out of the events of that day. This was a significant action on the part of our government, and we should never lose sight of that. CBP is a diverse agency, and our responsibilities are not limited to just border security. We are a national security agency. In the intervening 19 years, we've grown stronger and more sophisticated in the ways we protect our country. Together, we have taken countless steps to safeguard lawful travel and facilitate lawful trade. When we reflect on the past 19 years, there's no doubt that we've seen an incredible transformation in many aspects of global trade and in how we all work together. A spirit of collaboration guides our ongoing efforts between government and industry, between CBP and all of you, our trade stakeholders. From the earliest days of the Customs Trade Partnership Against Terrorism, or CTPAT, to the latest technology-driven chatbot that we've set up to field your questions about the new U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, we protect the United States together. That same kind of teamwork is currently on display as we confront the COVID-19 pandemic. This week, you've heard from many of CBP's subject matter experts on some of the most important trade facilitation enforcement areas of focus, from USMCA and forced labor to CTPAD and e-commerce. The global supply chain remains robust, and the work we do together continues to fuel our nation's economic engine in ways that are vital to our stature as the world's most powerful trading partner. However, against the backdrop of all of this activity is COVID-19, a global public health crisis that has affected us all, personally and professionally. For CBP, the pandemic did not change our fundamental trade mission making sure that lawful cargo keeps moving while preventing the entry of unlawful and potentially dangerous products. CBP continues to move trade through our ports of entry effectively, despite COVID-19. As the influx of travelers declined this spring, we quickly reassigned CBP officers and other employees as needed to help process incoming cargoes. Some of that cargo has been life-saving, and we're tremendously proud that we could facilitate the arrival of key medical and public safety supplies. An April 2nd presidential memorandum invoked the Defense Production Act, which gave the administration the authority to retain scarce medical resources, such as personal protective equipment or PPE, within the United States for domestic use. We continue to work closely with our colleagues at FEMA and other agencies to make sure these critical supplies are reaching those in our communities that need them most. To that end, CBP established the COVID-19 Cargo Resolution Team, or as we call it, the CCRT, to facilitate critical shipments of PPE 
and to resolve cargo admissibility issues for legitimate trade. The CCRT created an online portal to triage inquiries and provide up-to-date guidance from CBP with links to guidance from the FDA. To date, the portal has received more than 24,000 views and the CCRT has fielded approximately 2,500 inquiries resolving cargo holds and expediting the release of critical imports. The CCRT has also helped secure the importation of over $2 billion in COVID-19 related supplies. In addition, we've worked closely with FEMA to support Project Airbridge and other FEMA procurements. CBP has successfully expedited the clearance of over 400 flights at 17 different airports, facilitating the importation of over 1.3 billion pieces of PPE. And now, that same CCRT is engaged with the Department of Health and Human Services to support Operation Warp Speed, which aims to deliver 300 million doses of safe, effective COVID-19 vaccine by January of next year. Our commitment to this whole of government approach has never been more important than it is right now. Not surprisingly, CBP has seen a relentless quest by bad actors to profit from the pandemic, trying to bring unauthorized, unproven, and potentially unsafe goods into the United States. I can tell you that CBP will never falter in our mission to safeguard the public from fake and unsafe products. We've been targeting and inspecting imports and exports that may contain counterfeit, non-FDA licensed medical commodities, and various other illicit goods. The public health and economic security of our nation demands our vigilance every day. And as always, our frontline employees have remained up to the task. Since the beginning of the pandemic, CBP has seized more than 140,000 FDA prohibited test kits and more than 12 million counterfeit masks. Through it all, we've constantly striven to earn and keep the confidence of our trade stakeholders and of the public. While the pandemic has undoubtedly made some aspects of our work more challenging, working together, we haven't missed a step. One of the most important aspects of effective partnerships is sharing information and continual learning. Acting Commissioner Morgan discussed this on Tuesday when he outlined CBP's continuing commitment to transparency, communications, and collaboration. Moving forward together is best accomplished through an exchange of knowledge and understanding, and I believe our mutual success depends on it. An excellent example of this pursuit is a special task force stood up late last year to explore continuing education possibilities for customs brokers. Given the changes we've seen over the past five to 10 years in the global trade environment, many of us collectively saw an opportunity to create and refine some uniform standards of practice in the licensed broker community. Directly responding to a request by our trade stakeholders, CBP created the Customs Broker Continuing Education Task Force. This task force is comprised of representatives from our Office of Trade, members of the Commercial Operations Advisory Committee, or COAC, and licensed customs brokers from around the country, many of whom have decades of valuable trade and broker experience. The task force is working hard to develop a framework for a continuing education program for brokers. The program recognizes several key considerations, including that accredited education must be available from a variety of content providers. It also recognizes that continuing education must be easily accessible by all businesses, large and small. We've taken into account the excellent feedback that we've received from our trade stakeholders and we'll work diligently to continue making progress on this important effort. Our next and last panel for Virtual Trade Week is on the 21st Century Customs Framework. As many of you are aware, the 21st Century Customs Framework is CBP's comprehensive trade modernization initiative. Its goal is to address modern trade challenges, seize emerging opportunities, and achieve transformational long-term change. Prior to the 21st Century Customs Framework, the last comprehensive trade transformation effort culminated in the 1993 passage of the Customs Modernization Act. This was a landmark piece of legislation at that time, but since then, 
the growth in e-commerce, rapid technological change, and the continued expansion of the global marketplace have changed the face of trade. The 21st Century Customs Framework is pursuing transformational reforms to help set the stage for sustainable industry success, enhance security, and improve economic competitiveness in the 21st century and beyond. We're currently developing some legislative changes that will open the door to a more efficient and effective trade environment for years to come. These legislative changes focus on four things, modernizing our approach to responsible parties, updating enforcement authorities, removing data sharing barriers, and reforming our consequence delivery processes for trade violations. Throughout all of this, CBP has worked hand in hand with our trade stakeholders. Your input has laid the foundation for the framework, helping us refine our approach, focus our efforts, and set us all up for success as we work through our next phases of development. We're very aware that when it comes to effective implementation, the devil's in the details. So CVP remains committed to ensuring that the trade community has every meaningful opportunity through regulatory notice and comment, the COAC, and other routine engagements to help develop regulatory, policy, and operational improvements. We'll delve into each of these concepts more during the 21st Century Customs Framework Panel. And so in closing, I'd like to thank you all once again for participating in CBP's Virtual Trade Week. I hope you enjoy our last session, and I look forward to seeing and meeting with as many of you as I can in the very near future. Stay well and be safe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Commissioner Perez, for those poignant remarks and excellent introduction to the Customs Framework panel. Thank you as well to our virtual audience for joining us today and participating in this unique trade week. I hope you've thoroughly enjoyed the earlier panels on USMCA, CTPAT, forced labor, and e-commerce, but clearly we've saved the best for last. My name is Travis Skinner. I am the Director for Trade Modernization in the Office of Trade here at CBP, and I'm very excited to moderate today's panel on 21st Century Customs Framework and a look beyond the pillars. I'm fortunate to be joined today by an expert panel of two incredible members of the trade community and two esteemed colleagues from within the agency. With us from the <coughs> trade community, we have Mr. John Drake from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, where he is the Executive Director for Supply Chain Policy an obvious choice for this discussion based on his credentials. Additionally, we have Mr. Ted Sherman, Global Trade Operations Team Lead at Medtronic, where he is responsible for enterprise-wide programs such as export control, country of origin, free trade agreements, trade systems, duties and duty strategy. Again, a perfect person for this dialogue. From within CBP, we are joined today by Ms. Africa Bell, the Director for our Base Metals Center. She manages and directs the administration and enforcement of trade laws and regulations governing the importation process for the base metal industry. And last, but certainly not least, we have Mr. Jim Byram, the Executive Director of the Trade Transformation Office here at CBP. In this role, Mr. Byram is responsible for providing CBP integrated business support services for the development, sustainment, and modernization of automated processing systems and transfer, transformative initiatives such as this one. So we're I'm grateful to each of you for taking the time to engage with us in the discussion. I hope it will so hope that it is thought provoking with respect to what a creative vision of the future could achieve if we collectively challenge the status quo. With that, before I delve into the substance of the discussion, I'm required to provide some administrative details and directions. At the bottom of your screen, you will notice a few icons. One of those icons is for resources. There you will find a one pager with information supporting today's discussion, along with biographies for today's speakers that you can download. You can also find information on posted on the Trade Week webpage at cbp.gov. 
You'll also find a closed captioning icon at the bottom of your screen as today's session is being closed captioned as well. Participants may submit their questions throughout the session and we will answer as many as we can before the session ends. If you're having issues viewing or hearing today's webcast, please refresh your link to ensure that you're getting the most updated feed. If you continue to have connectivity issues after following the steps that I just mentioned, please seek assistance from your technical team. Now, so with a heavy heart, before I get into this discussion that I believe we should recognize that today is the 19th anniversary of the tragedies of September 11, 2001, as the deputy commissioner just did. As we remember over 3,000 lives that were lost during this tragic event, I believe we can put into context the roots of a program like 21 CCF and why it is so important. From my own personal story on 9-11-2001, I was in college doing what most college students would be doing at 8.46 in the morning. I was asleep in my dorm room when I was abruptly awoken by my resident assistant and told to put on the TV. And what I saw would obviously change my life forever. I'm a native New Yorker. My father used to take the subway into work and would often transfer at the World Trade Center stop. And watching the tragedy unfold on television, not being able to get a hold of my family was immediately absolutely terrifying. Luckily for me, my family and friends were okay, but obviously not everyone was so fortunate. My friend still living in New York at the time went down to the site of the towers and helped doing everything that they could to find survivors or clear rubble. I wasn't able to do that, but that moment led me to focus heavily on my policy roots in my academic studies, particularly in the area of criminal justice. And when I graduated from American University, my first job was here at US Customs and Border Protection. In particular, I had the good fortune to work for Mr. Alan Gina on the Con Container Security Initiative and the Secure Freight Initiative. The undergirding of each of those programs was the notion that we needed, <clears throat> that we as a country needed to extend our borders in order to ensure our safety, to ensure that the next terrorist threat was something that we would be more prepared for. And at the time, the best way to do that was to station individuals at ports around the world to implement non-intrusive imaging equipment at those locations. Those programs are still effective today and non-intrusive imaging is still a critical component of what we do, but we should never rest on our laurels. We should never recede to old, old ideologies and concepts when the opportunity is presented to advance and do better by our society. We should never forget and the 21st century framework is about living up to that ideal of creating a better future vision. So I ask and challenge you all today to think about what is new and unique that has happened over the last 19 years? What opportunities have presented themselves? What new technology do we have at our disposal that can facilitation? And in response, I offer at least one concept. Look at the economy as an example. 15 years ago, the top companies in, on the New York Stock Exchange were those largely dealing in tangible or physical goods. For example, in 2006, some of the top selling stocks on, on the market were Exxon, GE, and Shell. In 2017, the top three companies were Apple, Google, and Microsoft. The world has changed. The most valuable currency is no longer tangible. It's ones and zeros, it's information. And the trade community and CBP need to adjust accordingly. So what does that mean for 21 CCF? It means that the time has come for the trade community to cash on in on the greatest commodity that is at our fingertips. It's just a question of whether or not we will harness it. For a moment, imagine a world where we are collecting information in an immutable manner through distributed ledgers and in doing so, tracking a product destined for the United States or elsewhere, going all the way back to the source of the production or mining. In that world, we could eliminate large swaths of forced labor produced products. We can ensure that COVID related personal protection equipment that we're receiving from around the world is safe for our frontline workers. If there are counterfeit PPE in that supply chain, we could identify where it came from immediately, stop others from using the same sourcing. We can identify transshipment of goods and stop some of those nefarious practices around anti-dumping and counterfeiting duties. In that world, we could have end-to-end -end transparency of the supply chain, make real-time data-driven decisions with the relevant 
trading partners that we have and ensure that we are collect collectively enforcing the laws through true informed compliance with a new level of reasonable care. This vision is no longer hypothetical. Over the past two years, we have engaged in public hearings, numerous meetings with the trade through our federal advisory committees and held extensive internal discussions with our subject matter experts. We've initiated discussions with other members of the trade community and refined our understanding of the gaps in our current data. That has allowed us to develop a legal framework, which the deputy commissioner mentioned, that will support this type of information collection and integration and create a new paradigm that builds on the past legal frameworks like the Customs Modernization Act of 93. And without further ado, I'd like to delve into that vision with my incredible panel and challenge you to think about the current, the current issues that we face and the limitations before us in a way where a world, in a way where US is leading the world with dynamic trade policies that forever change the current structure and paradigms that we're living with. And so with that, Mr. Drake, thank you so much for joining us today. Your knowledge of the trade industry through your work at the US Chamber is invaluable to this discussion. Perhaps a good place to start delving into this discussion would be to highlight some of the current challenges facing the trade community and where you believe efficiencies could be gained if we were to move into this new world of 21st century trade processing. Thank you. Well, thank you for that, Travis, and uh, thank you for the kind introduction and for inviting the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to be here on today's panel to discuss CBP's 21st century customs framework. Um, before I answer your question, I also want to recognize the importance of today. Uh, you know, I think we all remember exactly where we were and what we were doing on that day, uh, just as you uh, very eloquently uh, described your story. And I just want to say at the outset, you know, that our thoughts and prayers are with those and their families who were lost or harmed on that day. Um, you know, so Travis, to your question, I think you're you're absolutely correct. You know, the, the world continues to change in the years following 9-11. Um, companies continue to spread their supply chains across the globe. Um, there are multiple government agencies involved in the customs process. E-commerce is demanding a lot of our attention, much more so than it was uh, uh, you know, 20 years ago, um, you know, I think just in 2019, it accounted for over 14% of all retail sales worldwide. And I think there's strong reason to believe that um, COVID-19 is only accelerating uh, e-commerce's share of retail sales in the coming years beyond, I think, what anyone thought was, was possible at the beginning of this year. Um, but, you know, the business community is devoting more resources and energy to fighting growing challenges like human trafficking, counterfeits, and IP theft. Uh, just a few startling statistics. In 2019, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development found that the value of counterfeit goods in global trade as of 2016 was $509 billion, which is the equivalent of 3.3% of all goods imported and exported worldwide. And this is a 10% increase from what uh, OECD found in 2016, just three years ago. Uh, the Chamber's Global Innovation Policy Center, which is uh, a really important player in this in this work, estimates that counterfeit goods resulted in $29.2 billion of lost revenue each year to the, to the U.S. economy. Another startling statistic is that the International Labor Organization estimates that 16 million people are exploited in forced labor, including forced sexual exploitation in the private sector. Uh, this is just, it's an unacceptable number, and it's, it's a horrible number when you, when you take a look at it. Um, and, you know, look, these are not new challenges, but the bad actors are exploiting the changes uh, in the trade space in new ways that makes these uh, these challenges more acute, which is why you know we welcome CBP uh, or we, uh, for pursuing this initiative because we need to evolve uh, in the face of these changing times. Uh, you know, just a few quick remarks. The chamber's overarching feedback to CBP is that we have to partner together to confront these changes, these challenges. But, you know, as Deputy uh, Commissioner Perez said in his remarks just a couple minutes ago, he's absolutely correct when he says the devil's in the details. Um, we recommend CBP maximize its ability to adapt to new technologies uh, that are relied on by all traders. Uh, we recommend CBP continue to improve current technology systems that streamline compliance, uh, facilitate legitimate trade, and stop the flow of illicit goods. And finally, we urge CBP to continue pressing its existing authorities, like implementation of the STOP Act, and programs like CTPAT to meet these new challenges. 
Uh, so I'll turn it back over to you, but um, really looking forward to the discussion. And uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you, Mr. Drake. And that's incredible framing with some of those statistics. I think that the OECD number is always one that stands out to me and certainly was prevalent in the DHS report on counterfeits uh, that came out in January. So certainly something that we need to focus on in this discussion. Mr. Sherman, building on what Mr. Drake's dis on Mr. Drake's discussion on some of those big picture items, as well as the few implementation concerns, obviously the devil's in the details. I believe your expansive knowledge on the importation process based on your years in the industry will lend itself to highlighting where our current blind spots are in the process. In particular, maybe you could talk about now that we're looking to implement USMCA, where suppliers need to be cognizant of the certain labor value content or some of those other issues. But I kick it off to you for your opening comments. Yeah, thank you. And, and thanks, Travis and the whole group for organizing this. I think this is a really important discussion. You know, I've been on this and, and related journeys with CBP for quite some time through BACM, AEI, and uh, two COAC terms. I just want to recognize CBP for thinking critically about what the future trade landscape uh, will look like and how our trade processes need to change. You know, it's kind of like thinking about not where the puck is, but where where is it going? And the trade landscape is increasingly complex. So companies are increasingly integrated globally and they operate in real time, right? And you have multiple agencies involved in the import process, particularly in the US. And this requires some degree of connectivity via common systems, data, risk management. Um, so as we modernize our trade processes, there's a lot of promise here. So calling out a couple of the pillars, looking at the first pillar of 21st century processes, we have a real opportunity to modernize and streamline entry and revenue processes, really take an account-based approach wherever possible, eliminate providing redundant, repetitive data, and also taking into account how these principles can be extended to other US government agencies with hold authority. On the third pillar, ensuring seamless data sharing and access, there's clearly an opportunity to improve data sharing bi-directionally between government and players in the supply chain. Um, with the goal of reducing risk. There are times when government may have access to information that would help importers remain compliant, even potentially stop shipments uh, from entering the country if there's something violative uh, with that shipment. Also an opportunity, again, uh, to improve the process of PGAs getting the right information that they need to make informed risk decisions and moving fully away from documents wherever possible. That's where a lot of the friction still remains in the supply chain. And on the international front, you know, there are opportunities to harmonize globally, right? We've got companies, you know, like my, my company Medtronic is one of them that engages in international transactions every day. We, we cross multiple borders all the time. And to the extent we can extend this globally and harmonize definitions of data, sharing of information, as long as it's focused on, you know, reducing risk, I think that can be tremendously uh, valuable and, and drive efficiencies. And then on the fourth pillar of intelligent enforcement, I think tying this to the discussion about data, um, data can be used to segment risk and zero in on commodities, origins, importers, or other players in the supply chain that pose the highest risk. And I think we, you know, I welcome the opportunity to have a conversation about this point in particular to ensure that data collection is truly being used in a way that improves safety and security. And I think the trade community will be interested to know how expansive potential data collection would be and how it would be used. And if we're going to be really intelligent about enforcement, uh, the concept of trusted traders really needs to be part of this. You know, what would the, how would trusted traders be handled um, in requiring additional data? Um, would they be required to provide more or because of the controls they have in place, could it potentially be less, right? So, and I think we need to be really thoughtful too about different industries, different models and practices. You know, uh, manufacturing, multinational manufacturing is very different from retail. Uh, a lot of this comes down to systems. You know, a retailer is more is likely to have more you know monolithic, unified systems. Where in a manufacturing environment, a global environment, you have multiple ERPs involved, right? So how do we take into account all of that? I think that's really important. And it's getting to your specific question um, about kind of those third and fourth tier suppliers. I think part of the discussion, you know, needs to be how much visibility um, can SMEs or, or most companies for that matter, really have that far back in the supply chain. I think it's ultimately on the importer to know their suppliers and their products. 
And I think you've seen a lot of progress on this over the years, right? So in particular, as a result of programs like CTPAT, ISA, and as a result of new requirements that have come down over the last 10, 15 years, like Lacey Act and, and forced labor, you've seen a lot of, of going upstream on the part of importers. So typically in the past, before, before CTPAT, you know, you'd have importers purchase things from a middleman who got something from a middleman and they wouldn't even, you know, the, the, the vendor wouldn't even tell the importer who the factory was, which in hindsight just seems crazy, right? Companies know they need to have safe and secure supply chains because there's also a brand angle here. Um, so they need to know what's going on in their supply chains. And so that has really changed. Now it's very different in med tech where you're dealing with a lot of your own manufacturing and most of your imports and exports are from your own entities. They're from, from related parties. So overall, I think we need to keep this conversation going and think about how realistic it is to get at these third and fourth tier suppliers. What tools are companies going to need? You know, what information can CBP provide in particular for these SMEs to help them uh, stay compliant? So I think, you know, acknowledging that companies are different, supply chains are different, is really important as part of this discussion. Back over to you, Travis. Sir, thank you so much um, for that. And I, I'm really looking forward to later in the conversation when we can start to delve into some of the details around what you were just saying, how we could potentially get more information to the trade and suppliers um, and be responsible in the way that we need to get to that third and fourth tier with the technologies that are available today. I think Mr. Byram is going to get into some of that a little bit later. So I'm looking forward to that conversation. But for right now, Ms. Bell, wonder if you could expand from your knowledge on what we just heard from Mr. Sherman and Mr. Drake regarding the enforcement activities that we have to do around these issues and, and how that works from your perspective as at the centers and what you do with end-to-end -end supply chain transparency. Hey, great, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And it's a pleasure to be here with my uh, panel members, especially to talk about such a critical initiative that's gonna have a huge impact on the way we as the centers do business day to day. The centers represent a recent modernization effort, as you all know, for CP to enhance and improve the center dovetails perfectly with the pillars of the 21st century customs framework, especially speaking with regard to the pillars of trade facilitation and effective enforcement. At the core of CB responsibility are well positioned, which is developing relationships with the trade community to collect such data. However, there are, also, there are several other factors that can be approved upon to further assist us in this regard. Personally speaking from the Base Metal Center, we administer and enforce approximately 55% of CBP's ADCVD cases and about 70% of the Section 232 lines for steel and maybe nearly 50% of the Section 232 lines for aluminum. Although this is a very significant scope of work that we cover, our nine other centers have equal or more shares of our trade priorities for which they are responsible. But no matter the scope of work we cover, we all have equal shares in the same end game, which is protecting the revenue. And we all have to hurdle the same obstacles along the way. One of our biggest challenges in the centers, no matter what the trade priority is that we're enforcing, is our ability to complete and accurate data on shipments so that we can make the proper determinations on the revenue that's owed to CBP. The 21st century customs framework pillars, uh, specifically the pillar of defining customs and trade responsibilities for emerging and traditional actors, intersects perfectly with regard to what we really need today in the centers. The right data from the right people at the right time is at the foundation of our ability to effectively facilitate and enforce trade. Within the centers, our greatest risks lie in the unknown. New importers, shipments with minimal information, critical players in the supply chain that have had a hand and a part in the production, transport, storage, or any other aspect of shipments, of shipments that are being imported into the United States. That, those there are our greatest risks that we deal with day to day not having enough information, enough visibility into who those players are, what their specific role was within the transaction, as well as the pertinent data and information we need to make the proper assessments on that uh, transaction. When we have complete and accurate information, we can ultimately make better decisions and make them more timely. 
we're very often faced with not having the full range of data needed to determine the amount of revenue that's owed, or even from the perspective of the port officials, not being able to determine if the shipment is actually admissible. It would be idea if we were able to acquire greater authorities that would allow us to hold other entities in the supply chain more accountable for providing us with the level, level of data and information that's needed. In the world of ADCBD and now with trade remedies, the country of origin of the subject commodity is critical to ensuring that the United States government is made whole with regard to revenue owed and to also ensure a level playing field for our legitimate importers. Although many of our trade partners willingly provide us with the level of data and information required, as many of you know, there are several bad actors out there that just simply do not. There are a number of schemes that are at play right now as I'm addressing you. This is the reality that the centers operate in every day. A reality that can be greatly transformed if we had the authority The pillars of the 21st century customs framework will be a game changer for the centers and will further enable us to transform how we facilitate and effectively enforce trade. Travis, I'll turn it back over to you. That, that's a great introduction to a lot. I, I particularly want to pull out the fact that you mentioned the right data from the right party at the right time and how we can collect those pieces of information and knit them together in a way that is most effective, not just for CBP, but to Mr. Sherman's point for the PGAs, et cetera, so that we're, we're getting that information to everyone that needs it back to the trade community as well, to some of the points that were earlier made. Mr. Byram, I'd like you to maybe talk a little bit about how we can start to knit those pieces together. And I know your background in technology and all that you've been working on for CBP is sort of leading the way for some of the tools that we might need in this next generation to get us to that step. So I want to leave it to you, kick it off to you for a little bit to hear about your vision of the 21st century with respect to the technological tools that we have in our toolbox. Thank you, Travis. So the Office of Trade is always looking for new ways to meet emerging requirements and address future challenges. Leading the way for the Office of Trade is our Business Transformation and Innovation Division, or BTID. The BTID has taken the lead on new technologies in many areas, including exploring blockchain technologies, predictive analytic modeling, augmented reality, and most recently, the, USMC, the USMCA natural language chatbot a tool we are looking to expand to other trade topics on the cbp.gov website. Innovation is the application of creative solutions that meet existing and emerging challenges. With this in mind, we formed a renewed flexible vision of cargo entry in the 21st century entry process that supports the natural flows of the supply chain. Through meetings with the Commercial Customs Operation Advisory Committee, or COAC, we, we identified that while the supply chain can be broken down into nine distinct processes, CBP and partner government agencies are completely left out of the first three processes, which are product ordering, raw materials ordered by manufacturer, and transportation from manufacturer to carrier. Understanding that getting data earlier in the supply chain process is crucial to the safety and facilitation of goods, CBP is looking to have a transparent supply chain from beginning to end. Ultimately, CBP wants to know where goods and entities originate, the supply paths they follow, and ultimately who the parties are who take part in that chain. Today, technology can be used to institute this type of system, and we see sectors of industry building towards this. The challenges of COVID-19 make the need to achieve supply chain transparency through automation all the more necessary. The protection of legitimate goods, reduced examination time, and earlier messaging are crucial to helping industry compete in a tougher business climate while staying at the forefront of global competition. In addition to the innovative efforts within BTID, the Office of Trade has established the Advanced Trade Analytics Platform, or ATAP, which is a new acquisition program that represents a long-term organizational commitment by CBP to improve our execution of the trade mission. ATAP supports CBP's need for a holistic view of entities and the trade environment in order to predict and identify threats to ensure we can deliver consequences for non-compliance. 
The program will enable CDP to increase efficiency through integrated information sharing, stronger analytic capabilities to support decision making and resource management. In its early stages, ATAP is already investing in capabilities that will allow us to achieve program objectives. These capabilities include powerful data ingestion capabilities to consolidate the many data, the many sources of disparate trade information, both internal and external to the agency. A service delivery model that will provide trade focused data science expertise to the agency, which will allow CBP to develop customized solutions for the trade mission for the trade mission issues CBP faces daily and a case management capability to leverage software that facilitates increased visibility and cross organizational collaboration and are scalable to new and differing business areas. Finally, ATAP is currently collaborating with BTID and the CBP Commissioner's innovation team to test new technologies in a simulated CBP environment. This testing helps determine if further investment in that technology is warranted by the program. Some of the capabilities currently being tested include optical character recognition, entity resolution, and robotic process automation, or RPA. So Travis, I'll turn it back over to you and thank you for the opportunity to participate in this panel. Thank you, thank you so much, sir. I really appreciate that. I think what you said about ATAP moving forward is going to be tremendous in the way that if we collect better data that we can utilize in more effective ways. You also mentioned that we have some blind spots right now with product ordering, manufacturing, and transportation early on in the process that I think we should be highlighting. And I, I want to get into some, some dialogue now with everyone, but before we do that, I just want to refresh everyone's mind a little bit about where the five, what the five pillars are and how we got there. And so to the audience, I want you to think about the last several years, the last 30, 40 years in this country and the way that we've modernized in the past. So the deputy commissioner rightly mentioned the Customs Modernization Act, the Mod Act from 1993. And before that, if we look at what has changed leading up to the Mod Act coming into effect, I think we should really be focusing mostly on things like containerization and what that did to change the dynamic of the world of trade. So that was a massive shift. Containerization completely changed the way that we dealt internationally with our partner countries. And so we had to create some results, some changes in legislation and practice that led to the Mod Act, that led to reasonable care responsibilities, et cetera. What happened after that, though, is the question that we need to be answering now. So when I think about it, I look at post-1993, in 1995, we start to have the birthplace of marketplaces. In 2001, we start to have China added to the WTO and becoming a ma massive trading partner. Getting into that, we, we start looking at e-commerce exploding on the scene, as Mr. Drake mentioned, and the incredible growth that we see in that place in the early 2000s. And then just leading into the last couple of years, over 600 million shipments, small shipments coming in and moving away from that idea of containerization into what we see now today of really small, micro and medium sized enterprises utilizing different entry, te entry techniques and methods to get stuff into the country in ways that we never saw before. And so today, as we look at the fourth industrial Re revolution and the internet of things and the way that we can collect data, how do we start to harness that? And that gets us to where we are currently with our five pillars. And just to remind the audience what the five pillars are, because not everyone is as familiar and steeped in this as, as I am dealing with this every single day, I'll just quickly go through them. Uh, Mr. Sherman mentioned a few earlier, but we'll go through all five. So the first is enhanced facilitation and security through 21st century processes. The second is define customs and trade responsibilities for emerging and traditional actors. The third is ensure seamless data sharing and access. The fourth is employ intelligent enforcement. And finally, um, protect and enhance customer infrastructure through creation. So we're working on that as well. Really what I want to focus on in the last 45 minutes or so that we have is pillars two and three and demonstrate how that comes together really in pillar one and creating that process that Mr. Sherman was highlighting earlier. And so let's get into pillar three. Let's get beyond the pillars and talk about this. And as I mentioned, the second pillar focuses on emerging actors or traditional actors with new responsibilities. So Mr. Drake, you mentioned this in your intro, so maybe I can ask you to delve into this a little bit more, but 
how are we seeing the new actors participating in the trade process? And what is it that it's changing about the dynamic? What is the, the difference of the evolution of these small parcels? Can you expand on that idea a little bit? Yes, uh, you know, so it really, you know, I think, first of all, I think it's important to, um, to recognize that it's not simply the business community that has new actors in this space. You know, it's also the government as well, and not just the federal government, but also at state government levels too. Um, you know, they all have a stake in this. And so part of that, part of the challenge is educating uh, not just government leaders, but also businesses on what these new rules are, what these new responsibilities are. Um, traditional businesses that have for a long time had international supply chains, uh, they are putting more and more emphasis and responsibility into trying to have further visibility uh, into their second, third, and, and fourth uh, uh, suppliers. That's a challenge. And uh, for larger businesses that have the resources, oftentimes they will have people completely dedicated to this. Clearly, that's much more of a challenge for smaller businesses, um, you know, who, who do not have that ability to have that visit, have that visibility across their, their supply chains. Um, you know, I think with a lot of these new actors as well, I think there's, it's going to come down to where there are opportunities as well. You know, if there's not a, um, you know, if the rules are not the same across the board, then you know you're there's going to be constant sort of opportunities for people to try to look to kind of exploit where there are lo those loopholes or where the rules aren't consistent you know so for example if you're a express carrier and you have to follow a series of custom uh, processing rules that you know, the postal service doesn't have to follow then clearly i think there's going to be a line where certain types of entities are going to look to try to exploit that right and that's a that's a that's a problem from a business standpoint uh, for the express carriers, but it's also a problem for trying to stop counterfeits uh, and, you know, other bad goods from getting through the system. So I think that's that's an area where, you know, there needs to be that cons there needs to be that consistent rules that are placed uh, for everybody. Um, and then I think that the, the, and then kind of going back to this education component as well, with all these new actors coming on, there's really kind of this collapse of this idea that you've got sort of a domestic domestic market versus an international market. Um, and with all these new and the fact that like oftentimes more often than not, the goods that might be arriving in your doorstep on any given day could be from, you know, another state. It could be from just around the corner. It could be halfway across the world. And oftentimes you don't know exactly who those people are, but uh, who's who's delivering that. It's a, it's a faceless aspect, but making sure that they that that other party who's sending you those goods is abiding by the same rules uh, as everybody else uh, can be a, a tough challenge. Yeah, I really appreciate all, everything that you said. I want to focus a little bit on the postal versus the express, and maybe we can get into that a little bit later when we look at the, the full vision of the end-to-end -end transparency in the supply chain. But I think that's critical when we start to think about these new and emerging actors. And if we collect information from each of them in an immutable way throughout the entirety of the process, then we sort of do away with some of the, the problems that we've had in the past where you're relying on one particular party to give you the information. So uh, right now we have some of these failures because the Postal Service can't get the information from the foreign Postal Service that would tie all of this together, right? But if we instead are tying all of these things together because we're collecting it from the right party that has the information going back early on in the process, ingesting that into a USG system that is then diversifying the collection of that information, we sort of could potentially do away with some of, of the problems of the bifurcation between Post and Express in the future that I think uh, harm us now. But uh, maybe we can get into that a little bit more, more later on. I'm curious, Ms. Bell, as, as we just outlined some of those, those challenges, does the distribution of actors, whether it's government or in the, in the private sector and trade, as, as Mr. Drake was outlining, does that make it more difficult for the enforcement or facilitation from your perspective? The, the distribution of actors, does it make it yeah, more the, challenging? I would say, yeah, the yeah, broad distribution more and more important. actors being involved, does that make it harder for us to enforce and facilitate because there are these new and emerging different actors in the, in the marketplace? 
Oh, absolutely. The more actors that are in the play, the the harder it is for us to manage the script, if you will. Um, it definitely does because it presents a lot more um, unknowns and variables for it. And it's really trying to track down, again, that accurate information and who is ultimately responsible for getting that to us. Well, the importer is ultimately responsible, but, you know, there's so many hands in that supply chain. And so I think the more players you have to go through, sometimes the more diluted the information can become because we're just reaching back so far to try and get that accurate point of information and data. And it's hard for the legitimate importer sometimes too because there are so many players in the chain. They may contract with one entity, but then they may be contracting with others. So trying to get back to the source of that information is really challenging. And when you talk about new and emerging actors, that's probably one of the greatest challenges because there's no they're unknown to us, you know. Um, a lot of the new importers that you know we start to transact business with, we don't we don't know a lot about them. We don't have a lot of information on them. We don't know their supply chain. We don't know who they source from. Things of that nature. So that makes it very very difficult for us to get a good assessment, to be able to assess their risk level. Um, as well as just trying to get the information and data we need to make a determination on the shipment. Yeah, that's that's really insightful and helpful. I, I want to pull out a piece that you just mentioned that you said it's harder for even the legitimate actors sometimes. And I think this gets to a point that Mr. Sherman made earlier about trusted traders and that we need to be building up our trusted traders and utilizing the information that they get. And I'm, I'm curious, Mr. Sherman, from your perspective, now that we see these new and emerging actors, do, do we think that they're sourcing from the same places that a lot of the traditional parties were sourcing from, whether it's mining or production or, or whatnot? Are they getting the same material from the same places? And if that's the case, can we utilize the information that we're getting from our trusted traders and traditional parties to better understand where some of these other actors might be also sourcing from? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Travis. And I think, um, you know, you're seeing so the answer is kind of yes and no. You're seeing industries change rapidly. So, for example, um, we're seeing tech companies uh, getting into medical devices, right? And you've had a significant amount of disintermediation occur in industries like retail, where you know smaller entities, U.S. importers, may be able to source directly from an overseas factory using a, a e-commerce B2B platform. And industries that are more commoditized. I assume that you're going to see some of the same players or same regions when it comes to manufacturing or production. You may just have more importers now going after those same producers, but you clearly have certain parts of the world that are really specialized in something like, like electronics or textiles and apparel. So even a new player would likely source from there, but in certain industries that are changing, you may see new entrants themselves building up capacity, right? They may get into the production uh, of something in a, in a new way. Um, but they may still be sourcing from some of the same subcontractors that the existing players are using. And I think this is a great example of a, of a conversation that the Centers of Excellence facilitate so well, right? So I had the real good fortune to be kind of present at the creation of the retail um, Center of Excellence. And we have a great, we have great center partners uh, at Medtronic. And this is the, the perfect setting for bi-directional education and sharing, because I think, you know, the, the 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 trusted partners, you know, the importers who are engaged with their centers, they're more than happy to have these conversations about what's the industry landscape, how is sourcing changing, right? Because often, you know, a, a, you know, really well-meaning trusted partner is themselves, um, they can be the victim of this kind of stuff too, whether it's AD circumvention, um, you know, country of origin, you know, legal transshipment. And I think the centers are really a great clearinghouse um, for this kind of education about the overall industry landscape to occur. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And certainly, I, I think as we're able to collect more information, utilize ATAP, give more resources to the centers to get this data and utilize it more effectively, then they just become a better resource, both internally for CBP, but certainly back to the trade as, as the experts reaching back out to them. Um, Mr. Byram, as we talk about ATAP and some of those technologies, I also want to think about uh, tying these parties together. As we mentioned, there are these disparate elements and disparate parties. How do we use technology like verifiable credentials or distributed ledgers or, or you know, what people would think of as blockchain 
as a way of, of actually achieving knitting together all these parties? What do we need to do? Is that something we can do today? Maybe you could give some examples of where you're already working on this, but curious to get your take on if this is a technology we can use now, if it's something that we need to work on in the future, and, and, and how, does it, how do you envision this moving forward in the next five, 10 years? Sure, thanks, Travis. Uh, yes, definitely the, the technology is available now. Uh, we've been using it uh, in our PUSA concept um, for the past couple of years now. Um, we've used it for uh, the uh, proof of uh, country of origin in the uh, NAFTA CAFTA proof of concept we did about two years ago. Last year, uh, we did an IPR proof of concept. This year, we're doing proofs of concept with steel imports and, and pipeline imports. Uh, and, and what we're seeing is that um, in, in, in um, joint effort with, with DHS Science and Technology Directorate, um, we've learned a number of important things that, that have led us to create um, some worldwide interoperab interoperability standards that we believe will increase market adoption of this technology um, while lowering costs. So taking advantage of the uh, verifiable credential technology, that, that's an aspect of the, uh, the, the ledger technologies that, that we have, the, the verifiable credential, um, W3C defines it as a set of tamper evident claims and metadata that cryptographically prove who issued it. Um, so basically they're saying it's credentials that are built to be tamper proof, secure and, and verifiable. Um, the, these verifiable credentials make it easier to interact in the digital world, kind of like a universally trusted digital passport for verifying our identities online. Uh, they create an underlying framework of trust, uh, which help to improve accountability, improve security, reduce fraud, and drive efficiencies. These credentials facilitate interactions using um, what they refer to as a triangle of trust. So there's, there's three parties to, to the verifiable credential process. Uh, there's an issuer who actually creates the credential. There's a holder who stores that credential. And then there's the verifier who's asking for proof based upon those, those credentials. And the holder of that credential uh, actually controls their, their identity. They choose what they want to disclose and whom they want to disclose it to. Uh, so that credential could contain um, a, a, a bunch of different types of data. Uh, the holder can control what data uh, the verifier is able to see uh, and, and other parties are able to see. So, Using a distributed ledger technology such as blockchain, um, it leverages the verifiable credential technology and removes the need for a central authority or a middleman, such as a bank to verify uh, an account number or a government agency to verify that a license is, is valid and, and current, uh, because that's all part of the verifiable credential information there. So it's just a matter of verifying that the credential is there, uh, it's active, and the verifier can, can move on with, with uh, the rest of the data. So it's a much more transparent way of handling records uh, because the information is shared and viewed across the network or, or chain, blockchain. So with, within this distributed ledger technology um, and, and blockchain, for example, so owners of the data that, that's placed on the chain, the, the owners of the data control access to that data. So they control the parties who, who are linked to it, who have access to it, uh, and parties who can get access to the data. Uh, and that's controlled by the owner assigning credentials to, to be able to access the data. So if you think of a post office box, uh, if the owner of that post office box wants to allow another party to access its contents, they provide a key to that party so that they can retrieve the contents. So that's what assigning the credentials does with, within the blockchain or distributed ledger technology environment. So by leveraging the technology, we can tie all of these parties to, together in a, in a transaction. Um, in a simplified world, uh, we have a block created for a transaction. The block is then sent to every node on that network. Um, each of those nodes validate the transaction, so they verify the, the credentials of, of that block. And then the block is added to the blockchain, and the transaction is complete, and data is instantly available uh, across all parties that, that are on the chain there. So I'll swing it back to you, Travis. 
Yeah, Mr. Byron, thank you for that. Actually, we have a question from the from the audience asking about this very issue and wondering how we can how the trade can best engage in thanks of distributed ledger. And I think that gets back to something that you mentioned that we are working with the world community to set standards. But maybe you could delve into that a little bit about what the trade community can do to help us bolster and build this and maybe some of the SVIP issues and some of the ways that we're looking to to engage with with the trade community. Okay, great, great question. Um, and, and we are actively engaging with with industry. So as I mentioned, um, we've worked through the, the COAC. Um, so we do have COAC member companies who are participating in our proofs of concept. Uh, so we do have industry participating in them. Um, we, we have companies that, that will be participating in our SVIP, our Silicon Valley uh, innovation program uh, projects for steel and pipeline. Um, so, so that is very helpful. Um, as far as those who are not involved yet uh, getting engaged, um, definitely get up to speed with, with the, the technology. Um, blockchain is not the only thing out there. Blockchain is one that, that uh, COAC had recommended and, and we jumped on to take a look to see if that technology was, was useful, not only to CBP, but just across the, the general supply chain um, within the cargo environment. And, and so far, the proofs of concept are, are, are proving very, very worthwhile. Uh, definitely good feedback from both customs perspective and, and from industry's perspective. Yeah, it's really, really very helpful. And uh, and thank the, the trade for looking to get involved in this. Certainly, we're going to need support as we try to roll out something as, as monumental as 21 CCF to make sure that we're doing it the right way, that we're engaging with the trade, and certainly that you are are helping us shape what the future of something like blockchain in this in this process would look like. Um, I know we're, we're running a little bit out of time, so I'm going to move on to the next pillar so that we can get into some other elements of the discussion. Um, and to something Mr. Sherman mentioned at the top, I think we really should should delve into that, which is the pillar three discussion, which looks at focusing on ensuring seamless data sharing. From our perspective, when we think about that, that means potentially sharing information with three distinct parties, other government agencies, Mr. Sherman, which I know you want to get into, and I do as well, um, sharing information back with the trade community, and certainly the interconnectedness with foreign customs agencies and our counterparts to potentially allow for maybe even a shared single window, that would be tremendous. So Mr. Sherman, I, I want to kick this one off with you, but in the, in the past, we've discussed the importance of PGAs or partner government agencies to have the information they need early on at the right time to expedite the process. Um, can you talk a little bit about that from your perspective and what you'd like to see? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think uh, the PGA part of this is just is so critical. And I, you know, to give credit where credit is due, CBP has been relentless um, in recent years and has done a great job really trying to promote a whole of government approach um, to manning, managing trade with ACE, you know, previously the BIEC, just to try to get consistency in data, definitions of risk, um, how we collect information. You know, I think by and large, you know, the import process as it comes, as it relates to CBP is pretty smooth for most importers. And often the wild card um, is the PGA. Um, so there really continue to be opportunities with harmonization of data, reducing duplicate data submissions, getting rid of documents and images of documents, and just getting more predictability overall, you know, improving segmentation of risk. Um, I think, that's really where a lot of the benefit um, of these concepts can, can come to bear for, for US importers. So anything that can be done to extend uh, these principles of automation, data, simplification to the PGAs would really have a pretty profound impact on a lot of US importers. Yeah, and certainly agree. And, and so our focus over the last several months has been to, to reach out to our partner government agencies uh, that particularly you mentioned earlier that hold, have hold authority, FDA, USDA, right. but the, really the whole big that we work with so that we can identify how we get them the right information early on in the process so they can take action and make the whole process more efficient for everyone involved. Uh, certainly there are some limitations in the legislation that we currently have that I think we need to be cognizant of when we think about that. And 19 USC 1411 and the way that ITSD was structured 
and the way that CBP is sort of holding that information. If we move towards this distributed ledger blockchain, where it's a US government entity as a whole owning that information, we could eliminate some of the, the, the incumbencies that we have with respect to sharing information more readily. We could do that in real time. Um, so what Mr. Byron was talking about, uh, the, the PO box, if only the right parties can access that information and it is immutable, then we don't have to worry about who's getting it and how it's being utilized. So I, I think we can move towards maybe a, a more whole of government approach if we change some of our legislation. I think we should also just mention the fact that under some of our current legal structures, uh, in particular, uh, 19 USC 2071 note, where there are certain limitations with respect to the way that we can use information. There's a bifurcation of whether information is collected for commercial purposes or it's collected for enforcement purposes. And if we were to do away with some of those limitations, we could potentially be more effective in the way that we share information with the PGAs and the way that they can make early determinations. So I think that's key. As, as we talk about getting this more data though, Mr. Drake, I wanna bring you back into the conversation. As you mentioned, and as the deputy mentioned, the devil is in the details and certainly we don't want this to be seen as a power grab. And one of the questions I see here is, is what is gonna be the role of the broker? How are we gonna affect the broker? But um, I think we all agree that brokers were given more details about a particular violative party or sureties could receive more information about their bonding practices. Um, I know when I've been at the White House and had this discussion at roundtables, importers always said there's a scourge of counterfeits on the marketplace. And if the government could give us more information about abandonments or seizures or where the violative sourcing is, that that could help them police it on their own. It could help better inform compliance and some of the uh, responsibilities that they have. Curious, can you talk a little bit about if we could exchange more data with your constituents, what it would do for them to make them more effective, uh, to make the brokers more effective, sureties more effective, what would that look like? Sorry about that. Um, you know, I think, first of all, having real-time information is extremely important for not just the broker community, but the trade community as a whole. Um, and having better access to that data, I think, is is, is going to be a really core element of, of this that I think we're really interested in, in following through on. I think kind of going back, though, to having more data, right, it's, I think, going back to the, the line, the devil's in the details, I think one question we're going to have is, you know, what data is being asked to be collected? And we see 21st century, uh, 21 CCF as being a huge opportunity to kind of re-examine the data that C CBP is already collecting, especially if it's thinking about collecting additional data to understand how that data that's currently being collected is tying directly to the goals that CBP has as part of its very important strategic mission. Um, so if there's new, if there's more data that's being asked, you know, making sure that that data is justified in in helping cbp sort of achieve its its core goals and its core mission i think the second part is how is cbp asking for that data to be collected and what is cbp asking to do with that data once it is collected so two examples um, so in the last uh, 12 months cbp has issued two rules on brokers one is the uh, the most recent one is the modernization of custom broker regulations and the second one is a broker verification process both of these the chamber largely supports. And I think, you know, but going into the devils and the details aspect of this, there are aspects of this rule where CBP is asking the broker community to either uh, act as the as a police officer um, for for Im importers of, uh, of record, where they see potential deficiencies in the information that's being provided, um, or their uh, CBP is asking that uh, uh, the broker does, you know, travels to uh, the, the the business location, right, wh wherever it may be, to verify the information the uh, the importer of record is, is is providing to to the broker. I think this is one of those areas where the devil's in the details, where we get a little bit nervous, where we think it's it it may not actually be necessary to do in order to achieve the sort of goal that CBP is looking to do. Um, so, you know, I think that's that's where we get a little bit nervous and where we think that there could be, you know, again, these are both rules that I think the chamber largely supports, but, you know, there are aspects of that rule where we think it's probably a little bit of an overreach or it may not necessarily align with where, uh, where it actually helps to achieve the goal that's being sought uh, and so should be rethought. 
Yeah, I totally understand. And I think we do always have to be cognizant of why we're collecting the information and how we can be most effective in doing that. Um, certainly, as we go through this process of 21 CCF, you're talking about NPRMs and at that rulemaking process level. Right now, we're largely at, at the legislative level where I think what we're seeing from this panel is a lot of consensus on the, the idea that certain things need to be changed. And at the legislative level, where we need to open the door, open that aperture so that CBP has the ability to make that change. But as we get into the rulemaking, we certainly need to be working hand in hand with the trade community so that we are only collecting the information that's necessary. Um, I, I've had multiple conversations uh, in the e-commerce space. Uh, a couple of years ago, traveled to, to Brussels to be at the WCO where we, we talked about e-commerce data collection. And when we talked about it, my perspective in representing CBP and what we were trying to make sure that the trade community understood was we don't want overreach in what we need to collect to enforce for e-commerce. That's what we wanted to bring to the world. That's what we're trying to make sure we enshrine here with 21 CCF. So that means we have to work with the trade community to best understand what those dynamics look like. And I think we can best uh, we can best capture those those ideas in regulation where we have the flexibility to make the changes over time because we don't want to be stuck in a construct of, of legislation that, like right now, we're, we're relying on something from 27 years ago with the Mod Act to help us enforce problems that are of today. And that's, that's limiting, right? So we need to find ways of opening that aperture now yeah. um, so that we can do it effectively in the future. Uh, may I, I if I oh, may? Right. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say, I, I agree. And, and the point with those two, two examples was not to, try to relitigate or, or litigate in real time those those two rulemakings. It was more just to provide example that even with legislation that's being, uh, that's being debated with Congress, those similar types of debates that were happening with those two specific rulemakings are also going to happen on the legislative side where, right. you know, going back to your earlier observation about all the new players uh, who are in the trade space today with e-commerce platforms and the like, they all have different equities right uh today that may change with legislation and so they're going to be very concerned about where they end up uh when that legislation is is finalized and so they're you know it's so those those debates that are happening i think only continue happening in the legislative space um you know just as they are in the regulatory space understood understood completely uh, Ms. bell on the third element of information sharing i mentioned information sharing with foreign entities. And you and I have had this discussion in the past. Certainly we have to be careful about what information we give and maybe it's not fully giving information. Maybe it's a red light, green light or asking them to put a hold on something the way we would currently so that they could inspect it to a greater extent. But I'm curious about your take on if we were to exchange information that we got on say ADCBD and transshipment going from uh, country X to country Z that never dealt with the United States. And we were able to tell those countries to stop because we identified where that transshipment was illicit and it was a problem. Or we see that maybe in the IPR space where we see a sale of IPR going from one country to another that never touches the US. If we were able to share better data in some of these ways, carefully, obviously, what would that mean in terms of your ability to utilize information that the center has to really protect interests of the US even abroad? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So our ability to be able to share information as uh, with regards to shipments as they or goods as they move from country to country, that, that would really be golden for us because I believe that that's really where our blind spot is. It's typically at the source of that commodity and all the movements in between before it gets here to the United States for importation. So again, our, our level of visibility typically starts at the point that it's getting here to the US and it's being imported and we're relying on data and information provided about the life of that shipment prior to coming to the United States. So if we were able to share and exchange information with the foreign government, that would be huge for us because oftentimes, again, our, our goal is always to get complete and accurate data and sometimes that complete part isn't always met. So I have. I, I find that if we have critical information from some of those foreign governments and entities, that can help us sort of fill in the missing pieces and really get a better picture of the full life cycle of that shipment. So that would be golden for us if we were able to access that level of information on a consistent and on a regular basis. Um, it also would have a lot to do with um, 
uh, given us greater confidence about the reliability of that information, particularly when we're engaging with shipments coming from bad actors. Um, that's at the base of their of their operatives is inaccurate information. So being able to validate that or verify it against reliable information from our foreign partners would be huge for us. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a really good place to take what we discussed in Pillar 2 and Pillar 3, sort of sum that up and maybe try to put it in context of an example or two and answer some of the other questions that are coming in where folks are asking about what type of examples could we give about how this process might work or how verifiable credentials might work. And so looking at it from the perspective of, say, in the in the cocoa market coming out of certain countries where companies that could be trusted companies that we've worked with a ton might not know that they're sourcing from a farm that is illicitly using some of these forced labor types of practices. This gets back to something key that, that Mr. Byron mentioned at the top, which is we have certain blind spots now in our process, like mining production. Where did the good come from? Uh, who's the foreign Who is manufacturing the good? Did the foreign government take any steps to ensure that that good was something that, that could come out, that it was inspected and that it is legitimate? Um, who are the logistics parties moving it from point A to point B before it's even sent to the US? Something I know that Ms. Bell is, is very interested in, in getting information about. So when we, we think about those things, I think about if we were to apply a verifiable credential to the, to the miners, to the producers, to the sellers, what that would mean in terms of giving us this end-to-end -end visibility. Mr. Byron, could you maybe talk about that application of the technology in that scenario? Travis. Um, so by leveraging the, the verifiable credentials, so your, your digital verification, um, as you mentioned in, in mining, so for, for an importer or a supplier to verify that the producer um, got those products or obtained those products or produced those products um, legally um, and, and with the proper licenses, certificates, or, or permits, uh, if those were all turned into uh, a part of the verifiable credential and a part of that data set, that digital data set, uh, then that um, importer could, could be assured that when that verifiable credential is provided uh, for that commodity as part of the transaction that, that they're sending to a government agency to, to say that they're importing this, um, that, that is easily verified um, and, and can be accepted without question. Um, the verifiable credential, as I mentioned before, uh, it, once it's produced, it's not modifiable. It can't be tampered with. Uh, it's very secure, uh, so it's very trustworthy uh, and, and works well in this environment. As far as data um, being available, um, taking advantage of the this distributed ledger technologies, um, kind of one of its calling cards is the, the transparency to the data. So, so once it's on the ledger, once it's on the blockchain or once it's on the ledger, once it's on the network, um, all parties have instant availability and instant access to it, assuming they've been granted access to it. Those who have access to it have instant access to it. Um, it doesn't have to make multiple hops uh, between parties to get sent to the next party and then to the next party. Um, we, we do have the, the current ACE single window today. So we have 49 other participating government agencies uh, that have a hand in, a, a legal hand in um, the, the entrance of, of goods into to the US. Uh, but we're not leveraging um, the, the um, blockchain technology for that. We're leveraging web services and some other technologies. And that is multiple hops. Um, it's near real time. It's pretty quick that we do get the data passed back and forth between us and, and another government agency and then back and forth to, to the trade. Um, but thinking about how the technology could, could benefit our current process in ACE and, and how we could make it more efficient, uh, just thinking about blockchain and, and the ledger technologies that, that are out there, uh, if you think of all the transactions that go into making up 
um, the, the supply chain here with, with customs information. You've got your manifest, you've got your entry, you've got your summary information, and then you've got all kinds of changes that may occur um, after, after summary. And then you have your billing and your, and your payment information kind of all bundled together to, to make up um, that life cycle of that commodity that was just imported. All of that could be on one chain or one ledger. And as things are being added to it, it's immediately available to all parties on, on, on that ledger or on that chain. As things are updated, everybody is notified of the updates instantaneously. And the data is secure once it's on the chain as well. Yeah, that, that's great. I, I really um, appreciate what you said there and tying all of those elements together. And hopefully that answered the question for our audience. Uh, I want to I want to pull on that thread a little bit more with Mr. Sherman because some of the stuff that you said I think really ties into something that he mentioned earlier. Um, if we're able to think about that that hypothetical I just mentioned, cocoa production and the real time information, so we're we're able to give it back to we're able to give information back in real time to someone say that would supply CBP with a purchase order. And a lot of times that might be a trusted trader if we were able to go all the way back to that point. And a trusted trader we're sourcing for somebody new for, for cocoa production. And in real time, we're able to say, you should not be sourcing from that party because we understand that they are an illegitimate actor utilizing forced labor. What that would mean to the trade community, even the trusted traders where they're getting some of that real time data. And I also just wanna add before, before, that, uh, before you answer Mr. Sherman, what it would mean if we also have trusted traders providing us the information about their legitimate sourcing so that when we see it come from some other source, we're able to tell the small and micro medium sized enterprises that they also shouldn't participate because we know it's not coming from someone legitimate. Want to get your take on that. Yeah, that, that's a great question, Travis. And I think this, this kind of gets back to the point I was making earlier. I think that concepts like this are most compelling when we're looking at those real high risk uh, commodities, countries, sourcing locations and, and trade lanes, right? So um, by definition, certain things are, are riskier and are at higher risk of, of forced labor or IPR or anti-dumping circumvention. I think it, it, there is a lot of um, good there potentially in trading partners, importers, uh, hearing what CBP is hearing. It's that bi-directional information sharing, right? So you see the data on these shipments, you understand the supply chain, and you can help importers uh, avoiding, uh, you know, help them avoid importing something that's violative. Um, I think, you know, again, the devil's in the details. And I think, you know, expanding this, you know, really broadly is something that importers would want to have more conversations about. But I think for high risk uh, transactions, high risk origins and um, commodities, I think that, that that could be really helpful because, again, uh, in some cases, or in many cases, the importer themselves is, is the victim of some kind of scheme in this situation. Yeah, great. I, I'm just I'm going to pull a little bit more at that. So as we think about some of the things that we, we were talking about earlier with respect to um, AI and the Internet of Things and this fourth industrial revolution and all the tools in, at our disposal now um, and being able to tie information that we would collect, whether it's from a trusted trader or a party that we, we know, and I think in particular when it is a trusted trader or party that we know, that we would be able to say, uh, these are legitimate supply chains and anyone utilizing them, even if you're a small micro medium sized enterprise, that uh, you are also now legitimate because you are utilizing those same supply lines. And as I think you mentioned earlier in the conversation, that are available. And, and so I, I wanna just, just talk about that because there is a lot of gray market that comes in or certainly black market that could come in. And uh, in an example like say Botox where we get a lot of gray market material that needs to be stored the right way. And if it's not stored the right way, then it could be very harmful to somebody that is, is utilizing that product. And we see that often that comes into to our ports all the time. So if we were to see that gray market come in and it doesn't match any purchase order from a trusted trader because the trusted trader gave us all that purchase order information, wouldn't we be able to take better action in this new way of thinking, in this new world where we're expanding the way that we, we think about data collection? I'm just curious to get your take on that too. 
Yeah, and again, I think you know that that would be valuable. I mean, you're you're getting into kind of you know I know this is part of the discussion, right? That's that's getting into real proprietary you know corporate information, and I think you know importers are going to really want to know um, you know what the benefit is, how that data will be used, and that that's why I think it's really it's really important to think about that in the context of um, of high risk uh, type transactions, and that's something that again back to my my point about the centers, this is something where we can engage in a lot of good bi-directional education, not only with the data, but just an understanding and a mapping of how these supply chains work. Um, and I think that's something that the import community is more than happy to do uh, working with the C's. So the data component of this is really critical, but I think it needs to be really focused again on, on that high risk, on those high risk areas. But I think as far as developing broader supply chain understanding, uh, there's a lot to be gotten there out of the importers in this space who are partners with the C's and they're more than happy to, to do that so that CVP can see when something doesn't look right or doesn't make sense based on what the industry knows about how um, their supply chains work. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just reading through some of the questions here, which are good. And I, I'd like to be able to pose two folks on the panel. Um, And Mr. Byron, maybe this is a good one for you to start to answer, and then we can bring in the rest of the panelists. The question is, do you agree that there are two separate but related problem spaces? One, being trusted identity, and two, being secure data shared for transactions. Yeah, I, I think in general, I, I, I'd agree with that. Um, so it's always a challenge to, to verify that kind of the entity on the other end that you can't see uh, that just sent you data is actually a, a legitimate party. Uh, so being able to verify that um, effectively and, and definitively uh, is definitely a benefit. Um, as far as being able to, I'm sorry, what was the second part of the question about data? Um, in, how, in terms of how it's shared, I think was the, was the second part of the questions. There are two separate issues, like the collection of it and trustedness and then how, how it's exchanged or shared. Okay. Um, so as far as sharing, uh, if we're leveraging a, a distributed ledger technology, um, the, the data is available to, to all parties. Now the owners of that data and the pieces of data control what data is visible to the parties. So if there is proprietary information that should not be shared to one or more of the parties on that chain, the owner of that data can control that and only share that data with, with entities that, that they want to share it with. So that, that gives a lot of control uh, and provides a lot of security over that data. Uh, can't control bad data that's put on the chain. Um, we can make sure I mean, that bad data is going to be very secure, but, but we can't prevent bad data from being put on there. Uh, we can verify that the party who provided it is who they say they are, um, but bad data will be there and other processes downstream will have to verify that the, the data is actually accurate and, and just. Um, but Data sharing in that type of technology is definitely um, very easy to do and kind of one of the, the benefits and pros of using that type of a technology. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. I, I really like what you just said about the bad data piece. And I think that's critical because what we are trying to think about in 21 CCF is if we do get bad data, but it is immutable, we know exactly where that bad data came from. Then that means we can hold that actor responsible right now. When we think about holding actors responsible, uh, it's largely the importer importer of record because those are the parties that we deal with. Those are the parties where we're getting a lot of the information. But we could diversify the responsibility so that it is actually us being able to take action. The party that actually did the wrong thing. And by collecting pieces of information along the entire supply chain, I think it allows us to identify those anomalies in real time because we're able to see that other parties are giving us information today. Uh, and I'll, maybe I'll ask Miss um, Bell to jump in here with an example. But if we think about the res information being collected along the supply chain, and we think it is potentially being transshipped, that there might be an anomaly somewhere in that supply chain that would tip us off that it's happening. And if we're collecting information along the line in real time, then that means we might be better able to identify where that bad data came in and that it is bad data, that it is an anomaly from everything else that's happening in that shipment. Ms. Bell, I, I know you've you've done a lot of this work in, in the EPA space, ADCBD space. Curious to get your take about what it would mean to be able to identify where 
in the process the bad data came in and what it would mean to stop transshipment or ADCVD issues in some of those EPA cases? Um, absolutely. So um, you're you're right. The better the better we know the industry for that particular commodity, then um, the better job we can do sometimes in detecting the anomalies. Um, I would agree with Mr. Sherman said about the importance of really understanding the supply chain. Having worked with CT Pad previously in my career, um, I really got a very good understanding about the ex how extensive the supply chain is. How many players are involved and how important that knowledge parlays into the center, especially as we're dealing with specific industries, to really be able to understand that. I think first having that understanding gives us the foundation for us to be able to readily detect anomalies that would come in the information stream that we receive. But with that, to be able to identify anomalies, and, and, and those anomalies could be a number of things. It could be the claim source of a commodity, and it could be our knowledge to understand that there may not be a very robust industry in that country to manufacture said product. Um, so basically seeing some information in that, in that chain of information we're receiving that indicates that commodities coming from that particular country, that could be a tip-off for us. That can let us know that, hmm, there's something odd here, there's an anomaly here that's just, it, it's not sort of measuring up, if you will. So having that information, being able to detect those anom anomalies are huge because it then allows us to really make determinations as to whether or not this Good, these goods are subject to uh, a particular amount of revenue that's owed. And it, and it empowers us to be able to go forward and take the actions that we need to take to collect the money that's owed to, to the government. Now, and that's looking at it from a, an entry summary perspective, once the goods are already in the commerce. But, you know, again, also, too, having that information before the goods ever arrive or before they're released, that further empowers us to be able to better protect um, the revenue and the economy because we can handle it at the point that it gets to the United States and before we ever release it into the commerce. So um, having that kind of information, seeing the anomalies up front, it empowers us to enforce a lot better at various stages of the process. But ultimately, the end goal would be uh, either preventing it from coming into the United States without the revenue that's owed or ensuring we take action to collect the revenue owed, ultimately making the U.S. government whole. Yeah, I want to I want to pull at something that you just mentioned a little bit there, ma'am, which is uh, taking action before it ever arrives here. And one of the questions we have that I think came in a little bit earlier is, um, isn't some of these enforcement actions, some of this enforcement authority of collecting the data, isn't that what ISF is for? And I, I think that's a great question. And I think looking at ISF or ACAS as the way that we are collecting information and why we are collecting information is something that 21 CCF is trying to actually get away from. Because if we're collecting information for a particular filing purpose, or it is collected for security reasons under ISF or security reasons under ACAS, different than the 1484 purpose that we're collecting for the entry of merchandise, that's sort of a bifurcation that doesn't need to be there. It's, it's a it's a relic of the way that we used to do business. And I, I want us to think creatively, think about what the future holds. If we're collecting information from the best party that has the best data at the right time, and they're each participating in creating what would be an entry by putting their piece of the information onto the blockchain, onto the distributed ledger, then we sort of do away with these artificial reasons that we're collecting information. We sort of start to do away with some of the redundant collection of data that I think Mr. Drake and Mr. Sherman mentioned earlier. And, and Mr. Drake, maybe you could talk about that a little bit. If we were able to do away with redundant information collection for your constituencies, I think they would look at that as a benefit. And if the, the data is then diverse in terms of who's providing it, and it is verifiable, and it is along this blockchain or distributed ledger that allows us to trust it because it's immutable, what would that mean for, for your constituency? I mean, I think I think that would be a very positive development for them. Um, you know, I think that's something that we we've, we've been advocating for quite some time. Um, you know, I think it benefits everybody, uh, and I I think that'd be something we would be very interested in pursuing. Yeah, great, and Mr. Sherman, your take on some of that? I know you've had some some good points on this. I see you taking notes, so I'm, I'm hoping <laughs> that you want to continue. 
<laughs> yeah, no, I, I definitely, you know, I, I love what you said, Travis, about the kind of the concept of rethinking filings in general, right? Like, you know, manifest and ISF and entry and entry summary. And is there a way to, to rationalize that process? I think one thing that'll be important to think about, though, is, is there really, you know, is, is there any way that one set of data can serve all of these various purposes, right? Um, because the type of data you're asking for in an ISF is really specific to, you know, security, like container stuffing location, things like that, right? Is that, a, is that an indicator at all of, of um, increased, like, forced labor, you know, risk? Or does that need to come from another piece of data? Um, so I think, you know, and then do you end up just, you know, having these giant data submissions, you know, say in advance of vessels leaving, um, overseas because they need to serve all of these purposes. Um, so I think that's, that's interesting to think about, you know, in terms of when can, when can data, which is intended for one thing, be used for other things as well, but, you know, acknowledging that there are guardrails in place for a reason. So for example, something like ISF, um, you know, that there's, it's the best available information at the time. And it's just different from the kind of information that you provide on an entry summary, which is a much more granular, uh, level of detail. Um, but I think it's a conversation we need to have. Yeah, I'm, I'm taking notes too. So, um, uh, looking down here a little bit so I can take notes also, but I like what you just said about ACAS being different and ISF being different because it's, it's the best information that we have at the time, but mm -hmm. where we're thinking about it in this new world, the best information that we have at the time is collected from the party that best creates that data. So it's no longer a worry necessarily about some party down the line an importer importer of record, having to provide something that they don't even know fully about, you know, a carrier having to provide something that they don't really know all the information about yet. We're talking about the party that is creating that information and creating that data, providing it into an immutable system that combines it all. And I, I want to pull out another thread that you just mentioned of this massive reams of information that we could be collecting. And how do we, what do we do with all that? And that line leans into another question that we have here that I, that I want to read from, from the audience. As CBP seeks to get more data on private company supply chains in the future, is it possible that CBP would identify unintentional non-compliance via AI before the importer does? And how will CBP find balance with getting data from trusted traders and still enforce their mission? Uh, great question. And I, I wanna delve into this AI question a little bit with you, Mr. Byram, because I, I think this is, leads right into what ATAP can do. And if we're getting more information, if we're start to use predictive analytics and not just descriptive or diagnostic, sort of where we live right now, but we get into predictive and prescriptive level of, of AI and what we could do. I know when I was working on this with, with you and some other teams, Mr. Mills and others a, a little over a year ago, we were trying to get information to Ms. Bell about what we could see in trade remedy issues, but this is so much bigger. We could do so much more with this type of information. Uh, and it is a lot of data, but I think the AI can start to com comb through that information to utilize it effectively. Curious to get your take on how ATAP really builds on this type of architecture, utilizes this architecture to be more effective. Sure, Travis. Um, and great question um, that, that, that came in from the audience. So the, the amount of data that, that comes in, I mean, that, that's definitely key, but when we get it and who we get it from uh, is, is the real key. So if we can get the data earlier and we can get it from trusted parties, uh, and we know they're trusted parties, then through AI, we can start identifying the good data and start uh, identifying patterns. And all of a sudden we, we start finding that anomalies start popping up, things that aren't, aren't good, don't, don't match the norm. So AI can help us in, in that aspect. Um, doing additional analytics on it and leveraging that data to do predictive um, analytics on it, kind of spot where we think um, some bad, bad actor may pop up. Um, if we have a new trade remedy go in, um, what the, the possible impacts could be where we might see some transshipment start, start occurring through which countries um, we, we could leverage predictive analytics for that. Uh, as far as prescriptive, um, taking advantage of the actions of data um, coming in after we've done some informed compliance, um, what happened with that data? Did the data get better? Uh, if we applied penalties to it, what, what happened to that data? We can start seeing some patterns there. Um, does, does penalizing the, the bad party uh, stop the bad actions? 
does informed compliance actually work better than, than penalties to stop the bad actions? So with the data and with the analytics, um, we're looking for ATAP to provide, um, we, we should be in that position to be able to, to leverage that, to be able to do better predictive analytics and better prescriptive analytics. Yeah, that's really helpful. I think that gets into uh, the fourth pillar, which I wasn't thinking that we were going to get into, but it does get into that fourth pillar that we're thinking about in terms of really intelligent enforcement. And Mr. Sherman, I think you mentioned that that early on when we were talking about that, where we also also talk about consequence delivery, but really being able to use this information in the best way possible, we're really building out tools that in the future allow us to not just ut utilize it for, for facilitation and targeting purposes for CBP, but really to give information back to the private sector that they need so that we can do that job most effectively. Um, Mr. Mr. Drake, curious to get your take on, on that advanced data coming back to the trade community and what you would be able to do with that kind of information. I think it'd be enormously helpful. Um, I mean, I, there, there's aspects of data that you know, I think we're collecting now, but I think having that that wider range of real-time information, I think would be very beneficial for uh, what we're doing. And I think also giving more visibility uh, for our member companies to sort of understand what challenges they have in front of them and where they can make adjustments in real time uh, based on what they're seeing. Ted, maybe you wanna, a little bit more you can add here. I, I couldn't really catch a lot of that. I'm sorry. I think so. I think uh, uh, the question that Travis had was, uh, how could we benefit from having, uh, you know, information in hand uh, mm -hmm. for the work that I think is happening for you all uh, now and kind of going forward? How would that improve your own processes uh, and the work that you do? Yeah, so like more advanced information or more visibility into the supply chain. I think that, and again, getting back to those high risk areas, I think that is important. It help you know importers make more educated decisions and avoid risks. Uh, potentially, they might not have all the information that their government government partners do, and I think that would uh, that you know in those high risk areas that could only help compliance. Yeah, yeah. Ms. Byram. Uh, what about you? What do you what do you think? Is this uh, is this something you're looking at, or is there some where we can um, uh, uh, is, where there's already efforts underway? Yeah, the, definitely. Um, efforts are, are definitely underway. Um, so, with with the ATAP program, uh, looking to centralize all the data uh, w within uh, CBP related to to trade. Uh, and, cargo processing, so all the supply chain data, uh, and being able to leverage that to, to get the holistic kind of 360 degree view of, of companies and, and their, their supply chains. So definitely looking to, to take advantage of, of that aspect of it. And you know, just one, one more thing, kind of picking up on where we were earlier uh, a moment ago, as far as the responsible party to, to provide the information, I think that's gonna be a very interesting discussion. Um, and it, it'll, it'll be, it could be quite different by industry. You know, you look at certain supply chain players like carriers, for example, you know, this was, this was a big part of the battle over ISF um, back in the day was that you had, um, yeah. you could really see the, the difference by industry, right? Because in retail, for example, uh, importers were much more bought into the idea of the importer record, really, really being responsible for that data. And in manufacturing, multinational manufacturing, I didn't get it at the time, but I, I do now. Um, you'd think that, you know, the carrier would actually be in a better position to provide that information at origin. So I think identifying who those responsible parties are to provide this information, if it's not the importer, um, is going to be a really interesting part of this. Yeah, I know that we're really interested to see where that goes. Um, it's, it's an area where we, we've got a lot of interest, and I think our members have a lot of interest as well. Um, uh, but where there's really, you know, I think the opportunity to kind of change the game in a lot of really important and, and um, good ways. Yep, exactly. So I'm looking through some of the, the questions here. Um, so here, here's one I can make. 
Um, will CBP use blockchain to drive ACE? Many importers rely on CBP resources to, to participate. Um, so, so not necessarily, CBP is not necessarily pushing the, the blockchain technology. It, it's something we're definitely looking at. Um, it, it definitely has some possibilities. We're, we're seeing some good things from the proofs of concept that, that we've been doing with, with industry. And um, if, if that's the route we go, um, and we do take advantage of some distributive ledger technology, um, it, it would be a part of it. Uh, I don't see it com completely replacing uh, the way we handle transactions today immediately. Uh, it would have to be brought in and, and be as an optional way to, to submit data to, to CBP. Um, and, and then eventually over time, as industry adopts the, the technology and, and gets more engaged with the technology, uh, then we would expand our footprint of it with, within ACE. Um, ultimately, it makes sense that that we move to a more modern technology. Uh, we're using some some old technology, the electronic data inter interchange uh, technologies to to transmit data back and forth between CBP and trade, um, at least for for importation and and exports as well. Um, so, so it makes sense that we do move to a more modern technology in transmitting data b between um, our sources. Just another question here. Uh, so what happens if information you seek is illegal to share in the countries of origin? Um, I think this, this got to a point that Ted uh, asked uh, about not treating every, every import as the same. I don't know if either one of you want to take a stab at that. So as far as, so if the information you seek is illegal to share in the countries of origin. Yeah, um, yeah Ted, I'm hoping you might have some, some insight on, on that because it seems more like it's going to be on the industry side. Sorry, I was I was on mute, um, and I've heard that uh, you're on mute is the catchphrase of 2020. Um, by the way, um, yeah, it really that, that's a really interesting question. Uh, it's something when we talk about international data sharing, uh, we'd have to have to be very thoughtful about. Um, you know, if we're sharing information across jurisdictions, um, in particular, I can see some sensitivity around confidential um, information. Uh, might you know different countries might have different levels of sensitivity around that, um, and that that again kind of speaks to the idea of having it really be data that's most essential uh, to managing risk. Okay, hi everybody. So I see, uh, there you go. Was that Val? Hi, Valerie. Hi there. I'm here. So I do have a question. Uh, we have a question that came in about the fifth pillar. They missed it and they're looking for more information. I do want to share with our attendees today that in the resources tab, we do have an infographic here today on the trade events website. So under the virtual trade event, we do want to uh, share that as well. And one question I thought um, as Travis is working his way back to join us, I, I would ask that, that we have received here is a little more about the validation of data. And um, I think you can all kind of share um, a, a perspective on this, but um, there was a question about the receipt of data and if it flows back and allows the importers to validate that data. Um, not only that, but the data they've provided, but it would also allow them to validate the data that the brokers have provided to CBP on their behalf. And um, they are kind of wondering in this question um, what we may see as some of the issues on the back end there. And if we anticipate um, any ways that we can possibly mitigate those issues and what trades role would be there. So if we can just spend a little a little more time because I think you each bring a different perspective there, um, that would be great. So Ted, why don't we start with you first and talk a little bit about this exchange of data and, and the importer's role now to, to validate not only what they provide, but now what their brokers are providing on their behalf. 
Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And this gets back to that idea of, you know, the re who's the responsible party and all of our current construct it is, is that it's the importer of record. And, you know, in general, my view is that um, it is the importer of record who needs to understand their supply chain, um, understand the parties involved, um, the type of inputs into their products, and they need to make sure that they're giving data to their broker to make accurate representations. Um, I think, um, if we if we start to extend the I idea of data to again to things that are more um, business operational data like PO data or invoice data for example um, PO data is probably a better example that that I, I can see um, players in the private sector again having having concern about how that data would be used because that data is you know not perfect um, no no company in the world that I know of actually thinks that their data is, is percent great yeah. how the system work and the fact that this back-end data is not intended to be used for making representations to a regulator it's kind of inside baseball data all right. I think that's a good perspective, Ted. Thank you. We lost you just a little bit, so hopefully we didn't miss too much there. Um, I, I think we are, we're getting close on our time, and so I would like to take a quick moment. We'll do a little bit of a speed round here and ask each of you what you feel the one most important thing would be around our CBP 21st Century Customs Framework um, initiative. And, and it could be anything. It could be one of the pillars. It could be a challenge. It could be an opportunity. Um, but this will be your two second speed round on the one thing you think will will be the most important, or critical, difficult to overcome, like I said, either way. And this time, why don't we start with Ms. Bell, Director Bell? Of our time talking about, and that is about the, identifying the responsible parties, holding them accountable for getting the right information that we need at the right time. That's a great opportunity for us in terms of affecting our, our enforcement role within the centers, but it's going to be a huge challenge and a huge hurdle. Um, definitely the importers are the responsible party at this time in the environment that we operate in. But moving further out into the supply chain, especially to foreign entities and our suppliers and manufacturers, trying to get that information from them and holding them to a level of accountability to do it, that would be awesome for us. But I also think it's going to be one of our biggest challenges within CBP to get there. So that's what I would say. I think it's a, a, a dual thing there, an opportunity, yet it's also going to be one of our greatest challenges. Thank you, Ms. Bell. A true testament to how much our times have changed, right? Um, you know, we have entities we've never known before, entities we haven't done business with, with before, and now we're encountering them all the time, quite extensively. Great point. All right, let's go to John Drake. Uh, what would your one item be? So I think for me, and what's most exciting, and I think what's also going to be the biggest challenge, but also has the biggest opportunity is, is the data discussion. Um, you know, what data is being collected, uh, where, are there, where are there ways to make improvements, uh, and how uh, the data is being collected, you know, who should be collecting data or who should be providing data that isn't currently already, and who already is providing data, um, are there opportunities to revise or, or reform that as well? Um, you know, I think it's something where our members have a lot of, uh, a lot of interest. Um, I think they see a lot of opportunity there, and, and I, I share those beliefs. That is great. What better way to start and end with the who, what, where, and how of data, right? Um, and, and what those opportunities could present for us uh, and, and, and the deep dive that we need to take there. So thank you, John. I do appreciate that. All right. XD, Jim Byram, how about you? All right, Val, thanks. Um, so as far as challenges, um, so I mentioned earlier, technology is, is here. It's available now that, that we can implement. Um, we do have uh, industry that, that is on board so far. Um, so with stakeholder agreement, that, that's um, pretty, pretty easy to implement on, on the surface. Uh, there's a lot of other things that go into that. Um, I think one of the biggest hurdles is going, or challenges is going to be the, the legal aspect of it. 
uh, any statutes that have to be modified or, or new statutes in place, any regulations that have to be modified or new regulations that need to be in place uh, for the data that we want to capture and who we want to capture it from, uh, I, I think that's going to be the biggest, biggest hurdle um, and kind of be the long pole in, in the tent there. Uh, and then close behind it, um, at least from my perspective, to, to be able to, to work this technology and implement the te technology, uh, it's going to require funding that, that isn't present right now. So that, that's another challenge we, we have on our plate uh, to, to get this thing going. Thank you, Jim. I, I, I will purposely not call you our party pooper Uh huh. when you come down with the funding and the legal team. But hey, we're, we'll do a good reality check there. Um, all very accurate and very honest. Um, and as many of you know, those, those are very relevant factors for CBP as we look towards implementation. Um, so I, last but certainly not least, and then I will share my own perspective for you. Um, why don't we go to Ted? Yeah, so I think the, really the opportunity of taking this modernization work and extending this to promote more of a holistic one U.S. government approach uh, to managing trade would just result in really significant benefits for everyone involved. And that's that's one of my greatest hopes coming out of this work. Thank you, Ted. Um, I, I'm going to share that uh, I, I find, especially in my role in the Office of Trade Relations and some of my operational experience, as many of you know, um, we cannot do it without our industry partners. Uh, we definitely do not embark on these initiatives alone, uh, which is why we're having this conversation here today. Um, I, I think we're trying to get Travis back on. Uh, in the meantime, I do want to share um, um, an opportunity for everyone um, listening here today and participating in this in this panel. Um, as you heard throughout the week, uh, we are highly dependent on and we value our collaboration with industry. Um, and, and I wanted to share an opportunity with you all that um, if you or someone you may know would serve as the right industry representative on what on our on CBP's Federal Advisory Committee, the COAC, we have recently posted a federal register notice. Uh, you can find that here on the resources button. You can also find it online. You can email trade events and we will get it to you. Um, but it was it was published on September 2nd. It will close 45 days from that date. And um, we wanted to make sure that all of our attendees, our panelists, our trade panelists, and our attendees in the audience today definitely have an opportunity to collaborate with CBP and share that industry perspective and, and, and really contribute to initiatives like this and, and other modernization efforts. Um, I, I think Travis is back. Is that you, Travis? Am I seeing you there? I'm back. Okay. Hey. Well, we were a little worried about you there for a moment. So I'm going to hand it off to you to close us out. And and, um, and then I, I, think, I think we'll be in great shape. Yeah. Thank you, Deputy XD. I apologize. As we're having a conversation about 21st century technology, my technology decides that it doesn't want to work. So I am um, sorry that that happened. My computer rebooted in the middle of what was a really incredibly engaging dialogue and discussion. Uh, I really I wanted to be able to end the conversation with some of where we're going and the changes that we need to make. I, I would just highlight that this is a priority for EAC Smith, for Dak Wittenberg. This is something that they want to push forward. They believe in. They have entrusted us in the Trade Mod Group to make this come to fruition. And we can't do that as Ms. Ms. Newhart was saying, without the trade community, without doing this the right way. So I, I really want to thank the panelists, uh, Mr. Drake, Mr. Sherman, Ms. Bell, Ms., Mr. Byram. Uh, I really appreciate, appreciate your time today, the lively discussion. I really appreciate everyone in the audience for giving some of these incredible questions that were really hitting the mark. It, it shows that you get it, that you understand. And I, I hope that you stay engaged. I challenge you to stay engaged over the next several months Give us your feedback. Help us create this vision with you. With the right leadership at, at CBP and with the trade community. So, so thank you. Uh, Ms. Newhart, I don't know if you have anything else to add before we close, but that is my, my closing salvo. Thank you very much, everyone. And I'm sorry that I got dropped off for a couple of minutes.
Thank you, Travis. Thank you, Director. I, I really appreciate you leading the charge on this panel and moderating this effort. Uh, kudos to you. Um, and also to our great panelists and our attendees here today and the, the other days prior leading into it. This has been a very full week. We realize that, but um, again, we cannot do it without you. And we felt it was important enough to just continue our outreach and our engagement with our stakeholders. Most important above anything else, please stay healthy, stay safe, and thank you for participating in CVP's Virtual Trade Week.